Okay. Um, so where were we? Yes. So okay, multivariate elections are a system where we select a group of candidates to execute whatever uh, whatever the uh, group uh, is meant to do. But the challenge that multivariate elections often face is ensuring appropriate representation with respect to the demographic, social demographic attributes of the population. Um, and this challenge exists despite active political participation from candidates of minority groups. And without appropriate representation, their uh, issues are often not duly considered. We see this issue happening across the world, uh, including in Brazil, US, and EU, and other places as well. Um, so to address this challenge of uh, ensuring minority representation in elections, we propose something called a representation pact which is basically uh, suggesting uh, conducting election as a two-phase process. In the first phase, the voters decide the social demographic composition of the final committee. In the second phase, um, they vote on the candidates they would like to see in the committee. And then finally, using a computational process, a final diverse committee is chosen. Uh, we implement representation pact in an actual election. And in this paper, we focus on presenting the results as a case study what we learned, what were the criticisms, uh, what were the drawbacks, and what were the advantages. So before moving on to the details of the pact, uh, it, contextualizing it in terms of prior work, there has been a lot of work on elections, obviously. Uh, but there's also been a lot of work on representation in elections. Um, and our work generalizes prior notions of representation in elections, including ideas of proportionality, um, and things like proportional representation, flexible proportionality, and so on. Uh, there has also been prior work on use of computational tools for ensuring representation, but most of it has been theoretical in nature. Um, so our paper fills an important gap in terms of uh, providing lessons through an empirical case study. Finally, uh, it's related to participatory design principles uh, and tools used for citizen engagement and in democratic institution. Um, and it's great to be following Vinod Kumar's talk because we'll see a lot of things that he talked about featuring in our uh, work as well and in the lessons we learned. Okay, so coming to representation path, as I said, it's a two-phase process. In the first phase, um, the voters determine the criteria of representation that needs to be followed in terms of choosing the final committee. Uh, this, this phase of this election is formulated as a series of yes, no questions about whether the voters would like to see a criteria being satisfied or not. For example, do you want the council to have the same number of male and female members? Uh, so an equal gender representation criteria. In the second phase, uh, the second phase takes the form of a standard election process. For example, something like plurality at large voting, where the, can where the voters select the candidates they would like to see in the final committee. Um, and now that we have, uh, voter input in both these two phases the challenge is to basically combine uh, this this uh, these two phases into a process that chooses the final uh, diverse committee and the way this is done is that basically what we want to do is we want to find a committee which has the most number of votes amongst all the committees that satisfy the criteria that was chosen in the first phase and this problem can be formulated as an inte integer linear program with the constraints from the first phase, with the criteria from the first phase uh, being used as the constraints, and the votes from the second phase being used as to construct an objective function. And standard publicly available solvers can be used to solve this. Um, we'll look at a specific example of an ILP uh, in a later slide, um, and we'll discuss it further. So coming to the main topic of the paper, which was implementing this representation pact in an actual setting. Um, I'll briefly describe the setting. Um, the, uh, the setting was in the canton of Valais, Switzerland that decided to renew its constitution in 2018. Um, to, the, to renew this con constitution, uh, they decided to hold elections in November, 2018 to form a constituent assembly that would choose, uh, that would modify or make changes in the constitutions as necessary. However, the election required the candidate to be on party lists. 
Uh, so a number of citizens who were interested in still participating in the election decided to form an independent uh, political movement called Apel Sitoye. Um, Apel Sitoye members contested for seats in eight districts. And uh, they decided to use representation pack to hold the primary elections in these districts. Okay, so very briefly, the summary of the setting is our representation pact is being used for primary uh, elections for Apple Sitoya in eight districts. So as I mentioned, the phase one decides the criteria that is to be implemented. And in this case, the, after an internal consultation amongst the board members of Apple Sitoya, uh, they decided to put the following three criteria to vote. The first one was 50, was what was with respect to gender, uh, whether it's appropriate to have 50% male and 50% female candidates overall, with a difference of at most one in case the number of seats is odd. The second was with respect to age, at least 10% of candidates aged between 18 and 30, at, le at least 10% of candidates aged above 65, and at least 40% of candidates uh, between 31 and 65. Uh, with respect to region, uh, the criteria was that there would be reserved seats for municipalities in each electoral district. Um, so this was put to vote in the first phase. 347 participa uh, voters participated via a digital e-voting platform, and all three criteria were accepted in this first phase. So now we have our criteria, so we move on to the phase two. Uh, to summarize the results of phase two, um, a total of 151 candidates registered for the second phase. Uh, 1,308 voters participated, and each had multiple votes equal to the number of votes, uh, equal to the number of seats that was allocated for that particular district. Uh, in total, after the second phase and after combining uh, the votes received in the second phase with the criteria of the first phase using the relevant ILPs, 96 candidates were nominated. Uh, they, the group of selected candidates did indeed meet the criteria that was selected in the first phase. In particular, there were 48 men and 48 women, 27 people aged between 18 and 30, 54 people between 31 and 65, 15 people uh, aged above 65, and 40 out of 63 um, municipalities were represented. Uh, but to take a closer look at how the representation criteria, uh, representation pact worked in this case, um, I'll present results from one particular district, which is Monty, which was the largest of the eight districts. Um, it had 331 voters and there were 17 seats allocated to this district, uh, which was divided into four regions. So this is what the criteria was that was chosen in the first phase. And after the candidates registered before the second phase, this is how the, this is the number of, number of candidates that satisfied each criteria. So directly, we can see that all the representation constraints are indeed feasible in this case. Um, an interesting fact was that all four candidates with age greater than 65 would be automatically selected uh, because um, they, that's the only way to satisfy that criteria. Um, in case of Monty, this was the integer linear program that was constructed. The first set of constraints um, the first constraint was the total number of seats. The second was gender. Uh, the second was region. Uh, the third was gender, and the fourth was age. Um, without going into the details, what and just presenting the outcome, um, the top seventeen candidates, without considering the criteria, obtained fifteen hundred and seven votes. Uh, what you cannot see is that the optimal willing list was fourteen hundred and forty votes. So there was a disparity of sixty-seven votes between unconstrained and constrained setting. Um, okay, so having conducted this case study, we see some advantages and we receive some criticisms and it's important to uh, note them because that they will help us uh, know what to not do and what to actually do in future elections. In terms of advantages, there was this participatory design uh, idea behind asking voters for input about representation and composition even before asking them which candidate they would like to see in the committee. Secondly, even though the criteria was chosen initially in abstract, it represented a very clear commitment towards electing a diverse body even before the second phase happens. And this was important because a candidate, uh, after the elections, a candidate uh, 
stated in an op-ed of a national newspaper uh, that she decided to be a candidate because the mechanism guaranteed true opportunities for women to be elected. She said, for once, we were certain not to be asked to be a candidate exclusively to give an impression of equality. Uh, there were also certain criticisms, obviously. Uh, there was a disparity, as we saw, between unconstrained and constrained winning committees in terms of total number of votes. And this is bound to happen whenever constraints are introduced. Um, however, before the second phase, it is important that the organizers make the voters aware of these kinds of implications of, uh, of the chosen criteria. Secondly, there can be explainability transparency issues as with use of any computational tool in an election setting. And to counter these, this, uh, these kinds of issues, we, it's important to develop tools that allow the voters to play with counterfactuals. What would have happened if the criteria was different? What would have happened if, voters were, if, if the number of votes a candidate received was different? And we indeed developed such tools and made it accessible to the public to play around with the election, um, keeping the uh, candidate list or the voter list to be the same or change it however you want. Um, with, these, with, with this case study, it also provided us some information about how we would go about implementing representation pact in a future in, uh, election, uh, what would change, what would we do differently. And that helped us construct a set of guidelines. Um, in the paper, we present them in uh, detail, but here I'll focus on a few important ones. Uh, with respect to the first uh, phase, um, we see that the criteria were chosen or at least put on ballot after by the board members of Apple Ap Ap Uh Voters didn't have an exact opinion or uh, voters weren't asked for their opinion on what attributes should the criteria be based on. Uh, in future elections, that those uh, public opinion on attributes can also be sought before uh, the phase one part of the election. Secondly, the criteria could, should not be very, very strict. There should be some flexibility to allow as to allow the largest set of uh, feasible committees. Um, between phase one and phase two, it is important to make the criteria and, and its implications public when seeking candidates. Uh, and secondly, uh, like with every election, the organizer should make sure to uh, to, should, should try to make sure that there are enough diverse candidates, not just to satisfy the criteria, but to have a large number of feasible committees. Um, after vote two, the raw results should be digitized, anonymized, and published. Uh, source code should be publicly available for the computational part of the process. And potentially independent third parties who have the computational background should be appointed to audit the results. Okay, in conclusion, what I want to mention is that representation pact in general kind of represents a social contract for elections. There are two values that we are talking about. The first is the value of diversity and representation. Um, and the first phase indeed concerns itself with this value. It, uh, it, it allows uh, us to encode our, what, what kind of encode our idea of representation or provide input about our idea of representation in the final committee. The second vote, vote is about the value of political competence, whether the candidate I am selecting will re represent me uh, in the political context in an appropriate manner, manner or not. Mixing the two ideas in a single vote, as is generally happening in most elections right now, often leads to either representation or political competence not being completely incorporated in the winning committee. Um, the pact allows us to incorporate both these ideas by separating them out first and then combining them in an appropriate manner. Um, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and some of my co-authors created this website, fairelection.ch. I would encourage you to try it out. It allows you to create your own uh, election and implement the representation pact and play around with it. Thank you. I had a question about particip participation between the two rounds. Like, first, what was the per what was the voter turnout like 
uh, in the first round versus in the second round versus overall, and if that has an effect on, I guess, how you, yeah, how representative these values are, if you, there's like participation differences? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, but in the first phase, there were around 300, 350 uh, voters, but the number of people who had registered on the e-voting platform was something around 500. Um, in the second phase, there were 1,300 participants, but around, I think, 1,900 had registered. So there's some disparity in terms of what the turnout was, even in, even just looking at how many people actually registered and then showed up. Um, it, it, it definitely has an effect because we expect the people who were in the first phase to definitely be there in the second phase. But there are people in the second phase who did not participate in the first phase. Um, so this disparity can be an issue, especially in larger settings where there might be um, criticisms around potential strategic manipulations, uh, whether a group decides to create a criteria and put it and make it pass through in the first phase just so that it guarantees a particular person's election in the uh, final um, uh, committee. And these kinds of issues can arise, but it's important that um, the only way to address them is to create more education about what the electoral process is and why participation is required at every step of the process. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for a great presentation. Um, do you have any, any follow-up on how satisfied citizens were uh, with, with the process, any perhaps survey or something like that? Um, that's a good question. Um, in terms of satisfaction, there was some media uh, coverage of this and most of it was positive. Um, I was there when the election was held in terms of helping out the uh, computational part of it and no one kind of cursed me for it. So I suppose <laughs> it wasn't the worst feedback we could have received. Uh, but in general, like we did look for things like this kind of op-ed that I presented after after the election, what the voters thought about the election process. And in general, the feedback was positive, including as 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 I showed in the slide that some participants mentioned that the clear commitment towards electing a diverse committee encouraged them to be a candidate in the first place. Um, so I would suggest that I would say that the overall uh, overall feedback was positive. Thank you.